Hello, everyone, and welcome to Office Hours, where we answer your questions about media and production 24-7. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can always enter your questions using this QR code. Uh, the QR code kind of sends you directly into the system, and then somebody will take that and put it into our regular Mukana interface. And if you're a kind of a regular in the show that you know that Makana is where you can not only ask your questions, but discuss them during the show and vote on them. And voting is very important because the way the show is structured, the more votes a topic or a question gets, the longer we spend talking about it and the higher it rises, so the quicker we get to it. In our second hour today, we're going to be talking to Nick Bond, co-founder of Noise Industries, the publisher of FX Factory's plug-in system. So if you have any questions about how plugins work or how you can develop your own, maybe across any and all editing systems, today is your day. That's our second hour. Right now, it's time for your questions. So let's dive in. Alexander, what have we got on our list today? Our first question comes from Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas. What are the recommended audio chains to connect a Shure SM7B to a Mac versus a Windows PC? And we're going to start with Courtney here this morning. Courtney? Well, there shouldn't be very much difference between the Mac and Windows because you're probably going to use some uh, microphone preamp or mixer that has a USB interface. So it does the A to D conversion in the USB interface. And once it's in the USB interface, that's a standard uh, interface level. So it should be the same across Mac or PC. It's a standard audio USB uh, protocol. So uh, anything with enough gain, usually 60 to 70 dB gain, to, to get that, um, uh, the dynamic microphone of the SM7B is fairly low output level. And some people use a cloud lifter, which is a FET head uh, or a FET head, which is an FET preamp in front of it. But you should have something like a sound devices mix pre three or six, or uh, I have it, one works fine into the, I'm told into the road, Roadcaster Pro has enough gain uh, to get it up to a good level for either a Mac or PC. So. Either of those choices or any of your uh, interface, USB interfaces that are out there that have at least uh, 60 to 70 dB of clean microphone input gain will do the trick. Alexander. Yeah, so uh, a lot of good things there said by uh, Courtney. You want a preamp that's good enough. I uh, have found that for under, well under $500, the best interface that I've tested so far is the Lewitt Connect 6. I believe it's 75 dB of gain. It's 299 and it has two XLR inputs on the back and it has a dual USB interface similar to the Rodecaster. They have a really cool uh, really cool mixer application uh, and they give you several loopback channels. So this works for podcasters that want to basically combine all of the streams of audio going in and send that out as a, as a single uh, stereo output to a live stream or back to Zoom. Uh, without, uh, you know, with a mix minus as well. So these are really good sounding interfaces. They have onboard DSP, so you get a full parametric EQ, downward expander and compressor as well, and uh, a handy headphone jack there on the front. So I would seriously look at the Lewitt Connect 6. Also, if you don't need more than two, another option is the Rodecaster uh, Pro Duo, which is a smaller version of the larger one that Courtney has, uh, so less mic preamps. And those ones have pretty good preamps as well, with enough gain, certainly, to run that SM7B microphone without an, another uh, inline preamp there. Jeffrey Powers, your thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree with everybody, uh, what uh, Courtney and Alexander has said. Uh, the biggest thing is uh, the connection. So with Mac, you're going to be most likely in, going into Thunderbolt, whereas with a PC, you can go anywhere from a Thunderbolt to a USB. Uh, as long as it's USB 2.0, you'll be fine with whatever audio interface that you use. But as Alexander said, you want to do definitely do some research because it's about those uh, those preamps that really make the difference on how uh, how your mic's going to sound. Yeah, getting the level up, particularly with the dynamic, is kind of job one. Uh, normally, when you have some of those inline amplifiers, uh, you get a little bit of extra noise. So if you're super critical about your audio, just be aware of that. Uh, clean gain, as many people have mentioned, is your friend in this kind of circumstance. Let's go on to our next question. Next one comes from Douglas Carmichael. How do you choose an optimal reference level when gain staging? The Yamaha DM3 mixer doesn't have an output gain control on the effects engines, so I'm controlling the gain on the send to each engine. Alexander, dive right in. 
I haven't had a lot of time. I've had about a total of 10 minutes with the DM3 uh, as a quick demo, so I haven't really messed around with it too much. Uh, there's actually a surprising amount of, uh, of of mixer digital mixers that don't have any kind of... Uh, ma- if you're asking about makeup gain, a lot of them won't have that on the individual effects engine. So, for example, like I have a Soundcraft UI24. There's no makeup gain on my effects engines. Um, but what a lot of people do is they they will um, they will when they're gain staging they like to mix to a specific reference level. I know a lot of people that like to target the input gain, uh, the average uh, peaks to come around negative 18 on the meters. So if you get your mic gain staging right, so that you have tons of headroom that you're not clipping, then what you're sending into the effects effects engine, for example, if you send 100% of the dry signal into the effects engine. You shouldn't be clipping your effects engines if you've done everything else right in the stages that come up to it because that is absolutely that first step with the mic gain and getting that consistent across all of it is absolutely crucial because all the other steps in the processing chain like the even the compressors and any kind of noise suppression especially are not going to work optimally if you haven't set your mic input gain correctly so maybe start there negative 18 as a starting point and see where you go from there Jeffrey? So I've always learned that gain staging is the first thing that you do when you go to to mix anything. And then once you set that and you've got it set perfectly, you might have to touch it very lightly. It's kind of like EQ. Once you set it, there's only very little bits that you that you have to uh, make adjustments to during a show. So you set it, and then it uh, the other effects. If if somebody brings an effect that all all of a sudden starts clipping that, then that would be kind of odd. But uh, yeah, you definitely want to make sure that they're running that patch when you are trying to gain stage. Like for instance, a guitarist, I try and have them have the the crunchiest sound off of their uh, floor floor pedals just to make absolutely sure that that's where it's going to be set and then of course those sliders are going to be where where you make the adjustments during the show so of course i came out of the analog era and always the step was first replace every the the front end with some kind of tone generator that you know is sending out what back in the day used to be zero vu we've kind of gone beyond that and now everybody's in the digital gain staging process so negative 18 i've seen negative 24 i've seen negative 12 i've seen all sorts of quote standards whatever you're deciding is going to be your system input whatever level it's coming in if you get a consistent signal there that becomes the first thing and you make sure everything else is optimal based on that, then hopefully when you take that tone generator out and you put in the actual microphone or whatever, you know that everything downstream of that is going to be operating at optimal for the piece of electronics it's going through. Uh, that's kind of the overall, you know, this is a process of balancing everything so nothing adds a bunch and then the next thing has to reduce it or reduces it so low that the next stage has to boost it up to get a consistent signal through. Alexander, do you want to get back in on? Yeah, and also one more quick thing too. When you're doing a sound check, if you're running the sound for a band too, uh, if, especially if you do not know the material well, once you pick your reference level, you should have tons of headroom, but this is also why sound checks are so important too, because you want to make sure that during the sound check, if they're running, if the band is running through a song, you want to make sure during the chorus, during the loudest peaks of when that vocalist is going to hit that note, that you do have enough headroom, and that's where that gain staging is absolutely crucial. And if you know during sound check that you still have headroom, even at the absolute peaks when that cor- chorus goes and the singer's belting it out, then your effects shouldn't be clipping at all, and you should be fine. Yeah, strangely enough, all the audiobook work I do, they want it in at negative 24 luffs. They they allow a lot of headroom to make sure that you don't clip anything because digital clipping is no bueno. And when it hits 255, 255 and everything, the next step, it goes to heck in a handbasket. You can't hear anything. Courtney, you wanted to get in. Uh, yeah, usually for gain staging, you, you want to work backwards. I don't have a picture of the DM3, but I can show you on the roadcaster here usually you set your output level uh if you have a master level there's usually a unity gain mark which is this little tick mark right here about three quarters of the way up on the sliders and so you set your uh input level at unity gain and then you work your way backwards to uh the trim level and and if you have any gain adjustment on your sound source uh prior to that uh, you work your way back to that then you set your trim level and when generating a normal signal that's coming in from that device, like play your guitar or play your 
a synthesizer or talking to your microphone in a normal level. And then you adjust the trim on the uh, input stage uh, so that it's uh, peaking on the meters at the area where you want to drive your output, like minus 12, minus 18. And that way uh, you work your way back uh, from the end to the beginning so that you're sure that nothing's going to be overdriving at any of the stages in between. So start at the end at unity and try and work your way back through normal normalcy, you know, like the input gain set halfway up and then go from there. Uh, Jeffrey. So uh, two things. First of all, when, when doing live sound, especially if you're doing... Uh, if your live sound is co controlling not only the main speakers, but also their in-ear monitors, which in some cases it will, that you you definitely have to, it's very, very important to make sure you have that game staging. And as Alexander said, have a good amount of head on there so it doesn't blow out their ears, especially if they're wearing in-ear monitors. And the other thing is, and this is a tip, if you have them doing sound checks, uh, a lot of people look up to the microphone and go, check one, check two. And that's, you know, just like what we do with our with our sound checks. You've got to have your voice ready. So have them sing and have them sing to their highest potential uh, instead of just having them say, check one, check two, because that's going to make a big difference when it comes to vocal, uh, vocal uh, mixing. Hopefully that helped you, Douglas. Let's move on to the next question. Next question comes from... Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. What are your thoughts on Tilta's new Kronos ecosystem? Uh, I looked a little bit at this. Jeffrey, what do you think? Did you check it out? Yeah, I watched the video. It uh, Basically, the what they wanted to find out is if this will replace uh, like a DSLR for uh, close-up uh, recording. They had a mus acoustic musician there that they were uh, that they were running around with. They showed all the parts. Uh, the cage looks nice, nice and sturdy. It's got a little fan uh, uh, fan synced on, on the backs to uh, keep the uh, phone cool. Uh, it's got everything. It could fit onto a gimbal, uh, which is one of the big problems that I find with uh, with putting any type of case onto a phone is all these companies think that, you know, uh, basically design the device around a no case scenario, but then you put a case on it and that just causes a whole bunch of issues, not only for the phones, but also the tablets. And uh, the other thing that I noticed is is... I don't think that case comes off very well or very easily, which means that you really can't use the iPhone 15 that's in your pocket. You got to buy a separate one, which I would do anyway, because I don't want to have somebody phone, uh, call me or Facebook message me while I'm while I'm recording video. It just doesn't make sense to have that phone as clean as possible so it can do one thing and one thing only, and that is capture video. Alexander? I have been waiting for this thing for months. I haven't seen a price yet, but I do have to say, in comparison to the small rig cages, this looks like potentially, until I get my hands and I'll reserve judgment for it, but it looks potentially like a, a, a more, like a better built product than the small, the small rig stuff. So very excited about it. I do think the, the magnetic fan attachment's really cool and interesting. And you know, I haven't had an iPhone overheat in a while. But I, I do recall an iPhone overheating when using it in summer just for video, and I left it plugged into power running for several hours, and it just shut off. So if that is still potentially an issue, and I imagine if you're going to be using this in production, you want to make absolutely sure on a hot day, if you're going to be using this for a shoot, that it's not going to shut off. So uh, I imagine if you were using it in Arizona, for example, you'd want a, a fan attached to the back there. Bill knows probably <laughs> something above that. I'd want so, a leaf blower I'm, in Arizona. <laughs> yeah, having exactly, lived there. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm waiting to see the price. I imagine it's going to be a little bit more money than the small rig, but if it's better build quality, I'm all for it. Yeah, there you go. Well, it's interesting to see how much development there is in these rigs. I mean, they're obviously small rig tilt. Uh, these it, there's just a lot of these that are very popular, and uh, somebody's spending a lot of money for them because the development is pretty hot and heavy. So keep your fingers crossed. And as soon as we get one in the wild and somebody tests it out, we'll come back to you and let you know what whoever that is thinks about it and uh, whether it's a better solution or just as good or whatever. Let's go to the next question. Andy Kokendofer in Vieira, Florida asks, is there a market for a Gucci multicam system? And there's a link to an RE camera system there. Yeah, I took a look at this earlier. It sounds really interesting. Courtney's going to start us off the Jeff Keithley will weigh in on it. So, Courtney? Yeah, I just don't know. You know, Ari, I guess, is trying to widen their market. You know, they, they make 
the primary camera that's used in most motion picture and and professional television uh, production, a dramatic television production. Using it for sports, I'm not sure they've come up with a new back on it. Here we can take a look at what it looks like here. <laughs> it's got, uh, I don't know what this 04 is, the countdown timer up there? I'm not sure. And they have a, uh, a remote, you know, they've they've got a remote uh, a camera control unit here, so you can control it for live. You can shade it remotely live, and that's what this back does. So instead of the recorder on there, you, you clamp this uh, this live interface on the back of it, which gives you uh, probably optical interconnect uh, back to the uh, camera control unit to feed your live image back. So they're going after a completely different market, but I think if they're using their same sensor, you know, if you put a big Fujinon lens on it, you know, uh, you may be okay because the depth of field is going to be so narrow for doing sports. I I think, uh, you know, Jeff may be able to to enlighten us here on the stuff that's used in sports, sports broadcasting. The the depth of field is so narrow, it's very cinematic, but awfully hard to to follow focus in an action type situation. Well, Mr. Keithley, what do you think? Well, from the sports idea or, or the idea of using this as a multi-camera solution in sports, no. Stay in your lane, man. Stay in your lane. Uh, anybody on a truck is going to have a Sony camera or uh, Grass Valley, and then probably the third is the Panasonics. Um, they're, they're just they're common. Everybody uses them. Everybody knows them. They don't want to go in with a bunch of GAC put together, uh, different ways of doing things and try to figure that out. That said, the wonderful, I don't say call it wonderful, I'm being sarcastic, I, that real big depth of field shot that the, became so popular with the uh, end zones, can't stand it myself, drives me insane. I, it's too jarring to me, uh, that cinematic look, whatever you want to call it. I don't like it in sports, but they are embracing it and they are using mostly Sony's in that, in that aspect, uh, Sony full frames, but the RE stuff, I mean, no, I mean, there'll be somebody in like the corporate market, maybe that this could appeal to that may not want it, that they're insistent. It was like, no, we want a cinematic look. I'm like, you're going to YouTube. What, what does it matter at that point? It's just, yeah. Now I, I'm not a fan, so I'm probably the worst person to ask about this, but as for somebody that uses multi-cameras all the time, no. Jeff, not on the field probably, but what would you think of this kind of a rig or this kind of a system since it's multi-camera in the talking heads kind of panel thing that we see often on the NFL and those kind of things where you got three or four people who are discussing what's going to be happening on the field. Would they want that shallow depth of field kind of more modern look there? I it's again it's controllability and it's common it's about being common the 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 chain the the camera chain is not common and nobody with a, a 20 million dollar truck wants to go in and go hey let's pull out these ccus and wire in the specialty cameras just to do a death shot they're not going to want to do that they're going to be fair like, enough no. that's a good perspective no. yeah alexander you had some thoughts yeah i'm going to throw this to jeff but just as an aside at if it's to, to corporate gigs, they're generally so drab, they need the cinematic, okay? They need the excitement. <laughs> uh, Jeff, um, I'm just curious. If you were to start over, and I know you made your points very, very abundantly clear about, about the shallow depth of field issue with sports specifically, but if you were to start over and you had the budget for it, is that is that the main is that is that the deal breaker? Are there other things involved with the with the whole ecosystem why you would still money no object you still wouldn't get get that re solution our camera chains cost more than that so money's not the object the the object is usability the object is having the common tools that we always have in our hands that's the object that's that's the biggest part and whenever camera manufacturers try to go their own way they'll never make it because people that are working trucks, that are working sports, that are working events, even for that matter, you want the same thing every time. You want to make sure that 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 color, the ability to change that color is on that knob right there every time. And that's why it it, it pains me to try to break away from that because I always in, you always end up coming right back to it. 
It's it makes sense. That's the perspective familiar. somebody's out in the field all the time. Oh, Courtney had a thought. You want us to get in, Courtney? Well, I was just looking at their demo uh, demo video, and, and here's here's a perfect example. Here's a freeze frame. Nothing in this frame is in focus. <laughs> <laughs> it's in their demo. Some of the grass video. must be. I mean, if the close-up stuff isn't and the far stuff isn't, the grass must the be somewhere in the foreground. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, it may be somewhere right out in here. Right. But these people are all out of focus, and this person's out of focus. Guys, so guys for, you're, you're losing. You're losing focus here. <laughs> you're losing focus here. That is the point. We well, don't I know they, they want it <laughs> cinematic, but you know those. I think it's it came from NFL films that used to shoot sixteen millimeter um, and thirty five millimeter film on the sidelines in slow mo. And they used I'm going to make up a defense here. That that person running out of the bottom right corner that's going to go farther, and she's going to be in focus, or he's going to be in focus for a brief period of time, and then they're going to cut away oh, from it. So it's it's oh. perfectly useful. <laughs> I'm <laughs> just making stuff up now. Let's move on to the next question. That was fun. Thanks for the question, Zach. Next one co comes from Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York. I have a Mac Mini running Sonoma version 14.1.1, and I'm wanting to pull in NDI feeds for broadcast due to budget reasons. OBS will be the software. Well, I need an external enclosure with an NVIDIA card to handle their feeds and the OBS broadcast. Uh, Jeff Keithley is going to start us out. Jeff? Well, from a uh, primarily PC user, uh, I in my limited experience with OBS as a platform in general, but also OBS on a Mac, I never use, ever. Uh, I've heard too many bad things, so I'll stay away from that. If I had to, had to, had to, had to use a Mac, which I don't because I have other computers. So if I had to, had to, had to, I would probably go with Mimo and, and I'll let Oliver throw something to that unless you want to use that mac now here's another unless you could run sienna's uh they call it india it used to be called ndi cloud but they now call it sienna.cloud and that is a backhaul solution so this is a perfect case of what a mac is great for you could put that mac down bring those ndi feeds into it send those up to the cloud and then use the proper pc and infrastructure in the cloud to do all your software mixing with all the tools that you want to the mac is just going to be a little drone that just sends the video up to the cloud that would that would how i would do it Let's see if Oliver has a different take. Oliver. Yeah, I, 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 I wholeheartedly disagree. The Mac is a fine <laughs> machine for live production. Uh, I agree on the OBS stuff. Uh, it's not good to badmouth other people's work, but uh, I have to feature Mimo Life here. And thanks, uh, Jeff, for mentioning it, um, of course. But uh, let's let's go to the, the question. And... Uh, one thing up front is uh, macOS doesn't have support for NVIDIA cards. So if you are using an external card, uh, it's going to be an AMD card. And if you are using a new Mac mini with the Apple Silicon, then that's out of the question at all because there's no support for e external GPUs. Uh, but that doesn't have to be. Um, uh, if you download the NDI SDK, it comes with a nice little application. Uh, it's a command line tool called application.mac.ndi.benchmark. Um, you find that in the NDI SDK folder in the library, uh, in, the, in the slash library folder on your Mac. And that tells you how many NDI streams the Mac you're running on can um, decode. And um, let me just uh, uh, quickly check uh, here on my Mac Mini M2, um, and uh, uh, I think uh, just to uh, a beep. Right. Uh, I, I, I'm. It's it's more than the decoding uh, capability is much more than your graphics uh, than than your network can handle, uh, probably. Um, so it's like uh, on the M2 Mac Mini, I think like something like 54. Um, uh, full HD 1080p uh, 30 streams in NDI that you can decode. Um, so that's really not an issue. I'm not sure about how OBS handles uh, NDI, how well it handles NDI. Um, I'm, I know that Mimo Life handles uh, NDI very well. Uh, NDI is one of our uh, my pet peeves. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful technology um, and um, I, I, I love it very much and Mimo Life is 
really supporting it where, with all it can. And uh, yeah, so um, the, the the answer to your question is um, you won't need an external enclosure if it's a Mac Mini uh, with uh, Apple Silicon. If you have a Mac Mini with an uh, Intel processor, an external uh, enclosure with an AMD card might help um, uh, because the built-in graphics card, the Intel uh, graphics card, isn't really very powerful. Um, I, I'm not sure if the uh, if NDI is actually using any of the graphics card for decoding um, streams, but uh, uh, it, it will help in any way if you're using an external enclosure with uh, a, an AMD card on the Mac Mini Intel. Uh, but that's like uh, even even on the budget, I think uh, you should go and get a Mac Mini with uh, the Apple Silicon. Um, I think at Walmart, uh, they are something like 400 bucks or something. Uh, and uh, that is a good replacement for any Intel-based uh, Mac you have. And um, so that's my recommendation on this. There you go. Uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, lots of lots of good information there. You got to remember that OBS is not native to or NDI is not native to OBS. So whatever you do, uh, it, they will basically it pairs with the NDI app. So if you just out of the box, you'll have one NDI feed, and that's pretty much it. If you use the SDK, you might be able to do a little bit more on there, but uh, for the most part, uh, that's basically what it is. The, the, uh, programs like uh, vMix, like Wirecast, and I, of course, I believe with Memo Live, uh, Oliver, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is NDI is already baked in there in a command in a certain version. Like, for instance, NDI 6 is out right now. Uh, to use it with vMix, you actually have to sideload it into vMix to get to the, all those functionalities. Otherwise, uh, whatever version of NDI is what they tested is what you're going to be using with vMix. And that's by design. So when it comes to uh, coming in the Mac using NDI, and if you would definitely want to use more than one NDI source, you have the NDI camera option in the tools where you can connect up to four NDI sources. Uh, but then you're going to have to do a little bit of uh, playing. And that's when OBS really becomes unstable is when it doesn't work exactly the way that it was planned to, which unfortunately there is no plan on how it works. Uh, I'm going to let Oliver sneak in because he was name checked there and then we'll come to Alexander afterwards. Oliver. Yeah. So, uh, the the SDK is something that is getting built into um, the application. So side loading, if, if you install the NDI tools from the website, you don't get NDI 6 in the app you're using because the app is using the SDK that's built into the app. In case of Mimo Life, that's something uh, NDI 5.5 something. Uh, which we will update um, as soon as NDI 6 uh, becomes a little more stable. Um, and uh, if you download the tools, you get the um, apps from uh, NewTek, uh, from NDI. It's now now a separate company um, from NDI with um, built-in version of this NDI 6 um, SDK. And uh, they are pretty much, um, they, they coexist, friend, they're friendly coexisting. Um, as far as I know about OBS, um, you may have to use an NDI plugin in some way. Um, I don't know if uh, OBS uh, has, you know, if uh, Jeffrey is uh, saying that it doesn't have native support, then it needs a plugin uh, to support NDI sources. Um, another way to use NDI sources is to use the NDI, uh, the, the um, virtual camera that NDI provides. So you have one uh, NDI input that you can use as if uh, it's a, a webcam connected to your computer. Um, and uh, you can exchange that uh, if you need another one. But if you use Mimo Life, you can have like you know twenty NDI sources at the same time. Um, given that your network handles that, I just checked. Uh, my Mac Mini M2 has forty-two streams of 1080p sixty uh, it, that it can uh, decode without any external hardware. Uh, so that's that's pretty good. Um, and uh, I think uh, sufficient uh, for uh, live production. We just had uh, last week uh, we had we, we did a test uh, Mimo live streaming test where, uh, in Austria, 
for the Lions Club Leoben with uh, five NDI cameras and our NDI in a box system that uh, we've also uh, discussed in after hours several times already. And um, it's you know a system that takes set up takes about how, an hour and a half, and uh, you you get uh, a, a quite a nice and powerful uh, live production system with five cameras. And uh, you know uh, best uh, thing about NDI is that you only have to run one cable to the camera, which has uh, power control uh, video and uh, everything you need and audio from the camera so uh, a pretty good system a pretty convenient system um, for the future alexander you want to pop in before we finish i don't think i have much to add other than that. the last time i tested ndi which was very briefly a few years ago it was still running the same version that they have now so i'm not sure if it's get it doesn't seem to be getting a lot of attention as much development time as the rest of the application is getting. So that makes me super nervous. And I think everybody had a good point there about uh, the overall reliability of OBS with NDI. I, I would per, would not personally trust it in a production environment. Fair enough. We've been on this for a while. Let's go on to the next question. Next question comes from me. I upgraded my Lumix G7 camera to a GH5, which supports LUTs. Color profile set to Rec. 709, which seems to look natural. What is the recommended color checker chart that I can use to dabble with creating my own LUT in DaVinci Resolve? Courtney's going to help us out here. Courtney? Well, there's a couple. Resolve supports a number of uh, standard color charts. I guess the most popular for matching multiple cameras, which is not your case, but is the DSC uh, Chroma Demand uh, camera chart. Uh, which is a little bit pricey here uh, if you want to get one. It's about 1500 bucks. But this lets you uh, align the colors, and you can put up two different cameras shooting the same chart and the same lighting sitting next to each other. And then, uh, as Alex says, just do a split screen and move the wipe across the colors here until the colors match and adjust the color balance until the colors match. And you can also use this chart for aligning the uh, uh, different aspect ratios to make sure that... Uh, uh, you know, I'll tell you, uh, the framing is the same. If you're just doing colors, a lot of people use the Calibrite uh, color, classic color checker chart, and these are a lot cheaper. Uh, you do have to, to uh, keep them, uh, you know, clean and put them away and take care of them. But this will let you uh, adjust your LUT to match your lighting situation. So you put this in front of the camera. And then you can use DaVinci Resolve to automatically <clears throat> uh, set the colors, uh, color balances to put you in the normal into a normal Rec. 709 area for the particular lighting uh, that you're in and whatever filtration you have on the camera. But you know, hey, you can adjust it way out of of whack anyway. You know, color charts are usually designed to to give you regularity from uh, shot to shot, so that. Uh, uh, you have consistency across uh, when you're cutting things together or if you're cutting together different cameras. So that's where it's really important. You can make it look any crazy way you want. If you just look at any feature films, there's some that are, you know, very warm and yellow and they're way out of spec uh, for normal skin tones. But it's it's an effect that, you know, it's a look that you're going for. So once you establish that look, then you can save the that settings in a lot and return to it. Hopefully that helps, Alexander. Let's move on to the next question. Next one's from Claudio Leggeri in Rome. What are, in your opinion, the best options to achieve an on-air TV, uh, TV show with a basic mid-augmented reality graphic? Is using a mobile phone as source of video, NDI, SRT, and tracking data as possible you would consider any personal experience? Thanks. Uh, Jeff Keithley is going to tackle this, Jeff. Yeah, I've definitely delved in this and dived in pretty deep on this uh, path a couple of times uh, for our broadcast. Uh, mobile phones, definitely not it. Nope, nope, nope. Definitely don't try that. Um, the closest thing I could find that was reliable and worked with most systems that were out there in the world that could do this, um, which are VizRT is one of our favorite partners. And so we were, we were testing with uh, their systems. Um, to really make it work because you need the ability to lock that graphic so that when you do a nice pan or, to, or, or zoom in or whatever, that that graphic stays in relation to whatever, that's the true sell of it. I mean, if you're just on a big wide shot, just put up a graphic that looks good. 
Uh, but if you, the, the real key is to put movement on it. Um, some of the, the really good systems out there, um, we saw some from Cam, Camrobotics or Cambotics, something like that last year at NAB, and they actually were tracking uh, cable cams going down a line, and then they were going through the graphics, looked phenomenal. I think they're actually used, some of that tracking was used in their really expensive systems, but get what you pay for. Mobiles? No, definitely not. There's just no information. The camera, the lowest level camera that I found that had 3D, 3D uh, protocols in it at that time, uh, I was searching, it was two years ago, it was the Panasonic UE150, which we already had in our stock, and it, we were able to make it work with that. Results were okay. Uh, I wouldn't say they were fantastic, but I definitely... Even though you've got a lot of telemetry in a mobile phone, you've got gyros, you have your 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 motion sensors and all that. It's it's just not the right tool for the job. Yeah, I'm going to support Jeff on this one 100. percent You know, the world of broadcast television, and I think you're probably in PAL land, so 25 uh, frame PAL land. Uh, is they're very standards and specifics oriented. To get into a transmitter, you have to match what the transmitter is expecting, and that is a broadcast signal. And most phones just aren't built to produce a broadcast signal. Broadcast campers are specifically designed to produce broadcast signals with the correct interlacing and the correct timing and everything else. So uh, this is one of those things where if you want to work in the TV industry and interface with broadcast, you're going to have to learn the standards that go along with that system. You can't really adapt things that are too far outside of it. I mean, you know, you can send a tape or even a phone a file and it's going to get into a broadcast control room and they're going to put it through some sort of a frame shaker and translate it into the broadcast standard and put it on the air. But that's different than an on-air live TV show. That takes a lot of pre-work to get that kind of content into a live show. To do it live in real time, you're in the realm of trucks and the kind of area that Jeff works in all the time. So, uh, yeah, I think that's the, the bottom line for this. Let's go on to the next question. Next one's from Andy Korkendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Starting in May, Meta, Facebook, Threads, and Instagram will begin to label AI-created photos and videos uh, with a made with AI underneath. Thoughts? Yeah, it's an interesting topic. I mean, everybody's dealing with this world of AI-generated content. So, Jeffrey, we're going to start with you. The problem is it's not just AI that we have to worry about because we've been worrying about this problem for a long time. Uh, Photoshops, I mean, how do they put four people into an inflatable hot tub? I don't get it. Uh, you have, uh, you know, the Amazon's big on that where they're showing pr uh, products and they show pictures. You know that it's Photoshop. And now now with AI involved, you can actually put that put AI uh, fragments into there. So you, are you really buying the right product in that case? So having the label down below is a good idea, but it, it basically needs to expand beyond AI. Is this uh, Photoshop? We had a big uh, issue after the eclipse, a lot of photos that came up that said, oh, look at this great shot that I had. Well, yeah, it was, it was faked. It was either Photoshop, there, there was AI elements in it, uh, back and forth. So it's more than just it's more than just AI that we need to be concerned about because they've been doing videos with, uh, with constructive editing involved in it for years. They've been doing photo uh, photoshopping for years. It's more than just AI. I would, I don't mind having a little disclaimer on the bottom, but there's definitely going to be photos that get mislabeled and they're going to cause stinks because of it. Courtney. Yeah, well, here in the United States, we're moving, you know, our legislature kind of is dysfunctional, but they're trying to move toward a means of uh, mandating the labeling uh, and metadata in AI, uh, if it's used in any ways, especially if you're using any images of celebrities. And I tell you, the technology, whatever they come up with, as far as the labeling, the technology will find a way around it. If you've looked at uh, what's available now, that uh, to the public, they have, uh, if you've seen Emo, uh, which is, here's, here's a look uh, at the risk of getting a flag. You can just take a still photograph, just a still photograph, and feed in a song, and you can't hear, I won't play the audio here, but it has animated this woman's face, and they have one with the Mona Lisa, which is pretty crazy. But it even puts the breaths in on the person, and it just started with just a single 
a single still video and it animates it with to the audio of the audio track that you feed it and does the lip sync, the mouth breathing, the eyes, the head turning, everything. And it's almost impossible to distinguish that live, that uh, AI generated video from a live person uh, doing that song. So you can see we're going to have to have some type of uh, labeling mandated uh, to be able to, to tell real from phony these days. Oliver. Yeah, so I th I think a label um, is is good for educational purposes, but um, in reality, I think we need to get used to uh, the fact that all images and all video we're gonna see in pretty short time time are gonna be synthesized, and um, in one way or another, um, if you take a picture with an iPhone today. It's not what the uh, what the sensor sees. It's what the AI inside the phone thinks uh, the uh, image should look like. Um, and there's a famous um, I don't know if you've seen that famous picture. I, I couldn't I wasn't able to pull it uh, pull it up, but the famous uh, case where a bride went into a shop and uh, she took a picture of herself with. Uh, facing mirrors and the left image was different from the right image and the center image uh, was her from behind and you could see her raising a hand in the middle image there was one hand uh, was up the other hand was down in the left image both hands were up in the right image both hands were down and the um, uh, the uh, uh, the solution to this riddle was that the camera actually took a couple of images and then uh, puzzled it together from the, the image together from parts of the other um, of, of the of the exposures of the various different exposures to uh, balance out you know lightning and and remove uh, any overexposure and things like that. So um, this is the reality already. Um, the big camera vendors um, uh, the, the, are following suit. Um, yeah, and and in, in in let's say two or three years, no no image um, that we see online anywhere is going to be the same kind of original that people are thinking in their heads. Um, like if you if you take a picture on film, um, where it's it's really hard to manipulate um, during the capture process. And um, so, so the label is going to be uh, in the end. The label is going to be on every picture that we see, uh, and that's kind of then um, uh, defeating the purpose of the label. Um, yeah, that's and, what I was thinking too. Know, is this process what doesn't use what won't use some form of AI? Is it utility AI? And I, I keep thinking back to the conversation we had with Michael Cioni a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he was talking about utility AI, the things where it's completing the ends of sentences that you're writing, and you can determine in real time whether or not you agree. And the generative AI, where you put in a bunch of prompts and it comes up with something that looks very impressive and very new, but is not really real. That's it's going to be a we're going to have this this discussion for for months coming out. We've got a good little bit of questions in here. And so I think I want to just move on. And I, I thank you. We'll have we'll come back to this discussion over and over again because it is so important to our industry. But for right now, let's go to the next question. Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas asks, what would be the best lens for office hours and similar shows for a Panasonic GH5 to get the effect that Alexander and Alex get with Boca, et cetera? Well, thankfully, Alexander is here. So, Alexander, tell <laughs> us what you're using. Yeah, so I did just I, – uh, I, previously, I was using G, uh, a G7 Lumix camera, uh, which is a micro four-thirds uh, camera. And um, the I've just switched it to a GH5, so same micro four-thirds, slightly more improved sensor, but uh, same type of bokeh. My background is very, very close to me. I, th I haven't actually measured it, but I would say it's three and a half feet maybe – at the most, I mean, if I turn around, I can almost, I can, yeah, I can touch, I can touch these base traps. So uh, what I did was I ended up getting a seven artisans uh, lens. This is a thirty-five millimeter fixed lens. It is a manual lens. I think it cost me one hundred and seventy-five bucks, something like that. And it's an f one point four. So you want to look at the aperture. So on something like a micro four thirds, 
you can get great bokeh, but if the background's super close to you, like it is for me, you're gonna gonna have to you're gonna have to get something well below 2.0, like at least a 1.7 or a 1.4, even better, if you really want that super shallow depth of field. Uh, that's I'm gonna be changing this lens at some point because with the manual focus and that incredible short depth of field, there's only a couple inches really of play in terms of, of focus. So if I move forward a couple of inches, you can see the hair on my face here. Just It's completely out of focus here. So uh, I am gonna be looking at another one. Sigma actually makes a great 30 millimeter lens that has autofocus and it's a micro four thirds mount uh, and it's not very expensive. I think it's about 300 bucks. So I'm gonna be switching to that soon. Jeff Keithley, you wanna weigh in on this? I personally don't have the GH5s. Uh, my uh, equivalent to that is the BGH1, effectively the same camera, it's just a little box, uh, using the Micro Four Thirds. And I tried to use it in my scenario here. I did not realize, Alexander, that your background was that close. That that blows me away that it's that close. See, mine, I mean, I got all the way across the room. I'd have to go touch it way, way, way over there. Um, but my background uh generator is uh probably about seven foot and what i found was i would have to build a larger led wall that i wanted to put in my space because of the uh bgh had such a wide we had wide lenses and any of the uh not so wide lenses we had uh seven to fourteens i believe yeah that's what we normally used and uh any of the not so wide lenses we ended up where it, it was just too tight and i couldn't get that that bokeh that fall off and stuff i i would say uh, in response to paul because i know he likes to just buy random stuff um uh, i would also look at possibly something small like this you know and shoot across the room from you to get that fall off and maybe drop it behind you that that would probably be the only other option and go to lens rentals or or now uh they, they actually own uh that other lens rental company, I forget what the name of it was like rent my lens or whatever. Uh, but go to lens rentals and try multiples because honestly, that is going to be the only way you'll solve it in a specific place. You can do the math all day long. I did the math here. Didn't work. So yeah. Try, I can't tell you the number of times I've had a low light seminar kind of thing and, and there's no light. You open up the lens all the way and you can choose between the tip of the nose or the eye, nose of the eyelashes to be in focus, but you can't get both at the same time. It can be very difficult. Uh, let's move on. we got a few more questions. I want to see if we can get through them all. All right. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. How did the Eclipse Field crews manage the crowds? Were there any hassles from local authorities because of lack of a film permit, for example? Now, we didn't hear any of that, but Courtney, what did you think? Yeah, I was not on one of the field crews, but I'm uh, shooting in Hollywood all the time. Uh, I know that in, in a live event such as this, uh, you don't have to have a film permit to shoot it. It's happening live. It's like a documentary filmmaker or, or a news photographer doesn't have to have permits. So, uh, and of course, the subject that everyone's looking at is many millions of miles away and up in the sky. So, Everybody that's there are there for the same reason as you are, is to shoot the eclipse. So managing the crowds, you know, uh, one of the things you want to shoot in this situation is the crowd because you want to see the crowd's reaction to uh, total darkness. Uh, well, not total darkness, but, you know, total coverage of the shadow when it goes by because that can be more interesting than that image that you can get from the observatory of the moon occluded and the corona around it, which is what everybody is going for to shoot. But even if it's cloudy, you can shoot the reaction of people and the birds and the animals and uh, everything around you is more interesting than maybe the thing in the sky that they're shooting. Jeff? For uh, being that I was behind the scenes watching all of these happening uh, at the time, the only one that actually had that we that I saw and we actually experienced a lot of crowd was uh, Kyle Hammonds, which is in North Little Rock, uh, not Little Rock, Arkansas, but North Little Rock. I just want to make sure that that's where he was because he was there. <laughs> um, and uh, inside joke for some of us that were on that production. Uh, so Kyle was like at a 
at a, I don't know, a, like a city park or something or, or you know, place. And so there were, there were people, there was a band playing. I mean, there were fireworks, no way with fireworks, but you know, there was all kind of stuff going off. Um, my son was down in, um, Lakey, Texas, which is Southwest Texas, middle of nowhere. There were a hundred people there, but they're all spread out on about 4,000 acres. So there was no, no worries there. Uh, maybe coyotes that were kind of coming by or something like that, you know, getting in some extra, uh, work. Um, uh, then the others that were there, uh, let's see, uh, Todd in, uh, Allen, Texas, uh, he was on his back backyard, uh, on his patio, yeah. not a big crowd there. So I, just like, uh, like Courtney said, everybody was doing this the whole time. What was there to do? You know, everybody yeah. was looking up. There wasn't a problem. I don't think there was much problem with that. I mean, the only real th problem you have is private property. If you decided that the best place is on somebody's land or an, on a, a commercial property or something owned by someone, you have to get their permission, like always, to shoot from private property. But if you're, you're dealing with any public space, it was just a free-for-all. The point was made. You're looking up. You're not looking at somebody's house and get their property involved. So next question. Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida asks, expecting anything new from sound devices at NAB, lower cost uh, analog to digital inter interfaces and with noise assist, a guy can hope. Uh, we don't know. Jeffrey Powers, have you heard anything from SD? Yeah, I've, I've gone through all the press releases. I've checked, uh, I've ch done some searches to see if they've announced anything for uh, NAV 2024 and nothing has come up. Doesn't mean that they're not going to. They might surprise us at the show. They might be holding close to their vest, but I have not seen or heard, heard anything from their PR team. Uh, so my guess is they're just, uh, they're just there to show off their products and uh, get a few sales. Courtney? Yeah, you know, they, they fairly recently, a few couple of years ago, changed hands. So I'm not sure if that changed their uh, roadmap for a new product introduction and whether the new owners are, you know, developing in that way, or if they're just supporting their existing product lines. They did recently, you know, fairly recently, uh, expand their uh, A20 Nexus wireless receivers, Astral Series uh, wireless receivers, which is kind of pricey, but... Uh, uh, so they'll they'll probably be demonstrating those, and I've just scoured their website now, uh, looking for stuff, and I don't see anything really new uh, in their news section. So if they are going to announce something new, they're keeping it. Usually, they would put something on the website, say, "See us for upcoming new products at our booth, such and such at NAB," which I don't see any promos for on their website. So it could be they're just going to be demoing what they have now. Discounts, Mickey, Mickey pinged me in my ear and said the words, uh, sound device is super nexus. I don't know what that means. So somebody yeah, can go it was screwing to the they, internet. It was a product that they came out with, uh, I believe, last year, year before, something like that. So they're just basically uh, showing it again. Ah, okay. So there you go. Let's go on to the next question. Paul Wallows in Austin, Texas asks, can Jeff break down his LED wall and give us a tour of it? Mr. Keithley, what do you think? Number one, you Paul, do it I appreciate your interest. I am not breaking it down because it's a pain in the butt <laughs> to do that. Can you break it down and put it back in the boxes for us? <laughs> yeah, and do I, an unboxing. We, we do that all here. the time, and this is one of the few times I can just leave it set up, and I just turn it on in the morning, and it's great. Um, all right, so I enjoy my wall, and, and, and the reason for, that I have it is because I'm doing some work with Unreal, and it's great to be able to experience it in the resolution that we're actually going to be putting it in. This is a 2.9 millimeter LED wall, so that means that it has – light emitting diodes led or as uh, some people from across the water will call it a lead wall not what we call it but led wall anyway so what it's made up of is panels and i'm a, i brought i had one of the guys bring me a panel that is similar to it so the panel is this big ah nice shot there you go so it's 16 by 9 form factor or something close to that not even close. Not nope. even close. There, nearly every LED panel is 500 by 500 millimeters or 500 by 1,000 millimeters. There wow. are some cool. that are true 16 by 9. Those are usually uh, only for basically for uh, install purposes. And that's kind of the newer style of doing things. 
Uh, these boards uh, are are all the ones that I have here. I used to have 500 by 500s, but the industry has kind of run to 500 by 1,000 millimeters because it's easier uh, to build for them. It's cheaper. And they're also a little bit lighter when you combine that distance, that height together. Uh, so you can put them up and uh, assemble them much, much, much faster. So uh, from that point, our, our processing is the next part that steps in. So we have the boards. You assign the boards, and there's here behind me are 12 boards. The different boards are all assigned uh, automatically by number by how I wire them, and I set that up in the processor. And so each pixel knows that I am going, if you top of the top left over there, it's zero, zero. Next LED, zero, one. Next LED, zero, three, right? right all the way across. So that's how it's done. Then I feed a 1920 by 1080 signal to it. This one is uh, at 2.9 millimeters. It's still nowhere close to a full 1920 uh, wide signal. So it basically just takes whatever I send it. That's what it displays. So think of it as you've got a whole 1920 by 1080 and it's only taking out that section of it. And so that's how it's basically fed to the board. Um, the processor can also do scaling. I try not to. I scale the source that's going to the wall instead. Uh, that's the common, more common way of doing it is I just make my source whatever it happens to be, whether it be scoreboards or which is primarily what we were using the LED walls for before when we were doing a lot more sports. Uh, and we were using these for scoreboards. And these are outdoor. Uh, these are outdoor. Um, they're the same one I, I picked up a minute ago. This one's an outdoor uh, board also. This one's actually a little bit older. This is uh, 3.9. You notice the more in that because i'm so close i don't know if you yeah, can see actually, it on, i'm seeing it on, on the, the zooms yeah, or sure. not but uh the moray is a big issue when you're using these in a virtual studio type environment as i'm trying what i'm basically working on here uh for clients is the moray is is that that how far apart those pixels are 2.9 is about the absolute minimum at the distance that i am and considering the camera that i'm consider that i'm using which is a off the shelf bowling uh, all in one box camera is all I'm using. I'm not using any special uh, lenses or anything like that. I, it, I, as I said, I tried the GH uh, variant of the BGH one, came close, but it was that I couldn't get the focal length that I needed. I saw too much of my extra wall and I didn't want to add another four panels in over there just to make that work because it'll cover a door actually. So I, there was a whole lot of uh, give and take whenever we were, I was building this space. And I also operate with my camera is straight in front of a 43 inch 4k that I use as my display. So, um, I don't actually have any space. I can move my camera back. I'm about a foot from the physical wall. Uh, it would be great to, if I could, then I could actually get a little bit more, uh, separation and I wouldn't have complaints every morning about my heads being so big in the Fenway framer because that, <laughs> that's a real issue. Apparently, um, I'm also from Texas, so I'm used to having a big head. So, um, that is pretty much it on the LED wall background. I I'm using a separate output off my computer to feed it. Uh, Paul, there's, there's nothing really magic about that. It's just taking, it, well, it's a separate computer altogether, but it's a unreal engine that's outputting to that point. Tell us the uh, truth. Did you really just get this for the NC2A finals? Is that the real reason this is behind you? Oh, no. I've had this up for months and months and months. Ah, okay. No, I've been I've been working on it uh, probably about three months. Uh, it, it, well, yeah, it was before. It was basically in December is whenever we put it up. So it's been more than four, three months. Uh, well, I was working on it for a client that we're building a, a studio build with. And so I wanted to see if this 2.9 mil would be acceptable in their space and and it's working out pretty well it just all depends on your cameras and how much space you have one real quick final question uh power consumption how how much load is there with this uh this whole thing runs on maybe six amps seven amps um, okay because uh, right now i was always gonna say this is an outdoor board or so it's outdoor rated that means it'll do up to five thousand nits versus an indoor rating which means it can't go outdoors and it'll get rained on it. It'll, it'll start frying this. I've had this in absolute pouring torrential rains and, and you just unplug it, let it dry out, plug it back in uh, and it works. But the other thing is I'm only running it uh, 14%. 
Okay, so you've All got right, the power nice. way down. So a, a simple way, 15 way amp circuit would be fine yeah. for but running. Yeah, it. a normal 50. I could run these uh, the same size board for scoreboards outdoors, full blast, under a 15 amp circuit easily. Yeah. Nice. Okay. A couple of announcements before we get to the top of the hour. And our guest, uh, first of all, Mimo Live. Remember, that's right after this at 11 p.m. And Oliver, who is here in the panel now, and his brother Aachen will be here to talk about Mimo Live Lab and what's new and what's cool in automation. So if you're a Mimo Live user, stick around for that. If you want to keep track of the office hours happening, start on the website where the schedule tab lists events that are upcoming. Tomorrow's show, we're going to break down our recent office hours eclipse coverage, talking about the back end workflow and what it took to create that. And don't forget, please, our National Association of Broadcasters convention covers starts this Sunday, uh, April 14th. We'll have a full team on site reporting from the show floor, so we hope you'll join us for that. And uh, let's we're at the top of the hour. We'll be right back with our guest. I want to welcome our second hour guest today, Nick Bon, who I have known for quite a while. The co-founder of Noise Industries is going to be giving us a look into the world of plugins, those incredibly useful add-ons that can make your work easier, more efficient, more colorful, or simply more useful. Noise Industries is responsible for the FX Factory plugin distribution system, which acts as kind of an app store for plugins, utilities, design tools, all the stuff that extends capabilities of uh, programs like Final Cut, Resolve. Of Adobe Premiere. Nick, welcome to After Hours, good, or Office Hours. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Bill. It's been a long time. Full disclosure, I've been running into Nick and chatting with him for probably more than a decade at various trade shows around. Uh, he's been in this business for a long time. And when the topic of plugins was brought up for the show, I reached out to him and I'm delighted that he accepted because most everyone understands the power of plugins when it comes to customizing workflows. So I'm going to start by having you tell us just a little bit about how, how Noise Industries got started. Yeah, so... Um uh yeah you know we, we've been around for a while uh we got started in uh in uh, 2004 so uh it's gonna be uh it's gonna be 20 years uh very soon uh we're gonna have our 20 year anniversary um and uh, so I, I guess it's it's safe to say we're we're not a startup anymore i, I, <laughs> I think I don't you've know. passed that barrier a long time i think it, it, it still feels that way but um uh but we got started um when um uh, uh gabriel uh, my business partner uh, and friend uh my friend from college really my best friend from college uh, uh, I, 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 uh when we were in college we always kind of like discussed and we were always saying that like, you know at some point we should like do something together and and once we once we're done with college and, and enter the uh into the real world, uh, and uh, and after college, uh, we stayed in touch. And then in uh, in two thousand and four, uh, he um, he saw a a tool that uh, um, on the uh, in the uh, Apple operating system called uh, Quartz Composer, and uh, and uh, decided at that time that um, this would be a technology that he could uh, he could use to. Uh, um, to rapidly develop uh, uh, plugins, uh, and uh, and this was the right time to kind of like start uh, start a company, and um, uh, to do this. And I uh, I uh, I joined that effort, uh, and uh, and we've been doing doing that ever since. We started um, I, I, with um, uh, Avid, uh, really. That was the uh, first uh, uh, platform that we. Um, uh, had our first products uh, for, and uh, and then um, uh, in uh, uh, 2005, 2006, uh, uh, we added um, Final Cut, and that's uh, where um, and, and it was I guess it was Final Cut Pro 6 or something at that point in time. That's when we uh, that's when we uh, uh, you know saw kind of like the first success, and 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 you know it took us it took took some time before. We figured out uh, uh, what people needed and what people wanted, and um, um, without giving too much detail, the the uh, at that time there uh, there was no uh, there was no app store. That concept was uh, you know this was uh, kind of like pre iPhone uh, app store. Uh, now this is a really established uh, uh, you know. Uh, 
a business strategy or, 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 or a distribution method. Now everyone understands how this works, uh, and. And it's, it's, it's well established both by Apple, uh, uh, you know, on, on iOS, on the Mac, but also, uh, you know, the Google Play Store and, and various other kind of like ecosystems uh, where uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, there's one company that, that manages it. And then there's uh, uh, the uh, the various uh, developers on the platform and uh, it's financed by taking kind of like a, a, a cut off of the uh, off of the sale. And we adopted this uh, at the time, um, I, I, not because we were uh, geniuses, but because we didn't have any money to pay people to build uh, <laughs> plugins. And uh, and uh, and and so uh, you know, we 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 figured the only way to kind of like convince people to join the effort uh, was by uh, you know like we, by telling them, okay, you can use our tools, you can uh, build your own, uh, you can build plugins, and then. We'll, we'll do our best to sell them for you, and and we'll take a we'll take a, a, a cut of uh, you know if you're successful you know for for every sale we'll we'll take a cut and the the, the lion's share will obviously um, uh, will be yours. And um, and well, I uh, mentioned FX. I mentioned uh, Noise Industry, but this is really FX Facty is kind of the the public facing brand for where people will correct. go to find your products, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. So, uh, so Noise Industry is really the company name, and and uh, and uh, and FX Factory is is the brand and the uh, the um, yeah the ecosystem uh, and the, the website and, and and everything. That's all the public facing uh, brand is, is is called FX Factory. And for people who haven't interacted, you have plugins that start around I think nineteen dollars was the lowest I saw, and it goes all the way up to your kind of big package at three hundred ninety nine, which has a gigantic group yeah, yeah, of yeah. things. Yeah, so it's very, it's very, uh, it's a very kind of diverse set of tools at this point. Uh, I, I, so um, lots of different uh, developers, dozens of uh, different developers, uh, hundreds of different uh, uh, products from these developers, and yeah, everything. Uh, uh, you know, we have a bunch of freebies also. So really, like it starts at free, uh, and then it's always a great the price. <laughs> yeah, that's the best price, and then it uh, and then it goes up to yeah a couple hundred dollars. We used to have uh, uh, some products that were. Uh, uh, north of thousand dollars, also uh, very specialized uh, at, at, at tools for um, uh, stereoscopic editing and uh, like stereoscopic and uh, 360 video kind of like uh, workflow solutions. But uh, but at this point, yeah, like a couple hundred dollars are the most expensive products that we that we have at this point, and it's it's mostly uh, visual effects uh, uh, plugins. Uh, uh, mostly, um, uh, yeah, you know, anything, you know, titles, uh, color correction, anything that you see on screen that's not real, we probably have a product that uh, that uh, helps with it, including uh, keying and uh, uh, some AI tools like background removal, uh, and um, and then um, and then over time we also uh, added um, uh, both audio uh, tools. Audio plugins uh, and uh, some workflow uh, solutions also, uh, and so we moved from kind of like being a visual effects plugin uh, ecosystem to kind of a uh, yeah more of a you know pro apps app store uh, situation that we have going on uh, right now. Talk to me a little bit about some of the contributors who build these things to to go on the store. I know there's a lot of names. Uh, it, it, you have so much up there, so much diversity in your products. Um, what are either the the developers or the products that have kind of been stars in this? Do you have any off the top of your head? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 so really, this is the the. Um, the power of the ecosystem lies in 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 in, in how it's set up. So, uh, I, we have a aside from kind of like distributing uh, uh, products, uh, people can use our our tools to build. We have a, a build products, and and and, and this allowed um, people without coding experience uh, to uh, to build plugins. So we kind of like built a whole uh, a whole tool set for them, and this allowed us to. Uh, you know, to um, to bring in uh, a new uh, class of people uh, uh, to build um, build products that we could then that we could then sell, and so um, th there were there were people that were 
would never thought they would become uh, uh, software developers or software distributors uh, uh, I, that uh, that were uh, professional editors and, and came from an editing background and uh, and uh, built solutions, ma managed to build solutions for themselves uh, that then ended up becoming uh, becoming product. And uh, so yeah, so there's a diverse set of uh, of people. Uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, um, uh, people that uh, build um, uh, templates uh, using uh, using uh, Motion, uh, uh, then uh, to uh, people uh, who uh, use our uh, development tools to build more complex plugins, uh, and then all the way to uh, 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 to products where people uh, really use really program uh, the, the entire product. Uh, and then we only uh, we only end up distributing. So we have the whole range of uh, different types of uh, different types of developers uh, that uh, kind of like work at uh, different levels of the stack uh, and uh, and um, and bring uh, a different uh, different skills uh, different skills to the table. We work with. Um, uh, we work with all of them and, and try to kind of like understand where we can add value. Uh, uh, so we don't we don't do the same thing with every uh, product or with every with every developer. Um, uh, some people want to do their own tutorials. Sometimes, uh, most of the time, we do the tutorials for, for them. We help them uh, uh, with that, for example. Um, so, and 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 who who are these people? Uh, you, you, you know. Many of them uh, uh, have come to us because they have uh, um, heard of us or, or, or found us online and, 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 and used or uh, uh, figured that uh, this is a, a, a place and a tool that they can use to, uh, to create product. Uh, and then others uh, we've reached out to because we've, uh, they already uh, had skills in this, uh, in this space or product in this space. Uh, and then, and then we reached out to them and said, "Okay, you already have a plugin. Uh, uh, you already know. Uh, 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 you already, you're already playing in this space, right? We can, we can work together and we can collaborate. And uh, you bring your strength to the table, and we bring our strength to the table, and we work together to, uh, um, to, um, you know, make the product better and to, uh, you know, uh, uh, bring the product to as many uh, customers as uh, as possible." I have to note that of the things that I have through your system, they've always been really dependable and pretty stable. I can't say that about the plugins I've run into necessarily from the wild world of, hey, guys, we're on a news group and I just wrote this plugin and it's fabulous. And you, you maybe take a chance on it, download it, and you find your system crashing or something. So there must be some quality control process that you guys have learned to, you know, from something that you're considering putting on your site to make sure that its its code or its processes are up to snuff. Can you talk to me a little bit about, about have you run into circumstances where you said, you know, this just isn't the right product for us kind of thing? I mean, we, we, I mean, we definitely don't release, um, you know, don't take every product uh, on, uh, and, uh, and 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 with time, with time, we've had to say, uh, uh, you know, uh, no, you know, more often, uh, and because uh, um, either either because the product doesn't work so well or. Um, because uh, it's it, there's already um, a lot, a lot of overlap with existing uh, uh, products, and we, you know you, you might not want to have. Um, uh, you you want to make sure, uh, as a curator of the ecosystem, that uh, that uh, every new product you know adds value. Uh, uh, so even if it's you know it, it, we're not super strict because there's always going to be a lot of overlap in terms of functionality and in terms of look and everything. So. Uh, I, I, but, um, but, but yeah, uh, we, 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 uh, we don't have a, a like a, a designated, uh, testing, uh, team to, uh, uh, you know, uh, test every, uh, every single, um, uh, product, uh, in a, in a very kind of like, um, you know, with a process that's, uh, that's, uh, set forth, uh, and, and, and is very clear. 
but of course, we 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 look at every new product. Uh, we we test it. We make sure that it uh, that it works. Um, but still, you know, it is it is software. There there uh, you know there are going to be uh, there are going to be bugs, uh, and, and this happens. Uh, and uh, and then uh, um, you know we, we do our best to kind of like help figure out uh, you know how to solve uh, problems if they arise. Um, one of the good things about uh, the um, the FX Factory uh, ecosystem is that um, you know it, it it offers update updating uh, functionality. So if 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 there is something wrong with a uh, with a product, if it's delivered through our ecosystem, then uh, the developer can fix the problem, and then we can you know. Uh, with the push of a button, uh, uh, push it out uh, so that uh, so that users um, you know uh, get a fix uh, as, as fast as possible, and uh, and because we've been doing this for a long time, there's even we've even built kind of like functionality that you know if there's an update that's 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 great, but sometimes you need older versions around to uh, work with older projects that you've uh, uh, done previously. So. Uh, I, we've developed the system so that uh, you know the container contain multiple versions of the same product, so that you know you're not necessarily breaking old projects uh, uh, just because you're updating. Uh, these kinds of things are really um, really important uh, in uh, you know just kind of just uh, consistency is really important when it comes to. Uh, people are working on project because uh, you know some people work on their uh, on their final Cut pro project for you know years uh and uh and uh and, and we do our best to make sure that uh, you know yes of course they should have the newest version uh at, at all times but you also have to be able to uh keep things running on that uh, the versions running that they they used previously now you have plugins for final cut but you also have them for resolve for uh adobe premiere and things like that do you see any trends in uh anything that's been interesting in terms of what users of the different platforms are more interested in, or is it all kind of across the board? Everybody is interested in everything. So, um, so our, our, our primary focus uh, has been Final Cut, uh, and um, I, uh, we, we very much support uh, uh, Premiere and After Effects. Uh, uh, also, we have some products for, for Resolve uh, at this point. Um, I, the, there's a, a, a large contingent of our products are really for Final Cut Pro only, um, uh, because they're, they're built using, uh, uh, motion using Apple's own, own technology. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, therefore there's just, you know, there's technically no easy way to bring them to other, uh, uh to other platforms anyways. Um, so that has been our that has been our focus uh, I, I, in terms of the number of uh, number of product. The um, the products that are uh, in some ways more more, uh, more difficult to build, but uh, I, that are that are actual um, plugins that are not built on built as motion templates. Uh, and those usually work on uh, on all the host applications that we um, that we support. Uh, directly, and that would include the um, the Adobe the Adobe tools. So I would I would say if you compare the um, uh, the, uh, the the different ecosystems, then I would say that, 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 that for Final Cut Pro we just have a huge array of products, lots of developers that develop uh, products for us. It's really like a um, very vibrant uh, kind of like uh, ecosystem. Uh, also, um, uh, lots of competition. Uh, uh, both internally in the ecosystem and uh, ex externally, there's just a, a lot of players in this uh, in this uh, in the in the in the uh, Final Cut Pro template uh, uh, world. Uh, and then uh, when it comes to the um, when it comes to the uh, the, the, the plugins, uh, 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 the kind of like more complex uh, products in terms of how how the how you build them. Uh, uh, those usually work in in, in all the uh, all the host applications, and uh, that's a very different game. There's uh, uh, um, much fewer uh, um, players, uh, and uh, uh, and um, uh, but but also here, you know, our footprint is the largest in Final Cut, uh, and then in and then uh, uh, Premiere Pro and uh, and After Effects uh, are are also very very important to us. Um, before I 
turn it over to Courtney for some of his questions. And before we get to our audience questions, um, do you see trends? Can you tell that something, whether it's a hardware product or a, you know, there's something in 3D or something that's suddenly very popular and everybody wants to do, I don't know, extruded titles or something. Do you see these trends coming through the app's popularity on your system? Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I would, I would say so. I mean, I think, I think that when it comes to, uh, you know, some of the visual effects and the titling and, 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 and these kinds of, uh, uh, these kinds of things, there's, there's, you know, there's definitely kind of like taste changes, uh, uh over go. time. Right. So, 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 uh, I, 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 there, there's been a, 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 you know, we can see, we can see those, see those trends and, and, and sometimes, you know, some effect is really, really, uh, really, really new. Uh, and then, and then it's really it's used everywhere, right? For uh, a couple of years, and then, and then after that, it kind of like uh, it becomes uh, kind of left interesting. Maybe a couple of years later, it will come back. It's kind of like a, like fashion, right? Uh, in some ways, <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes things have a, have a second have a second uh, life, right? And then, um, so there's the, that's, there's the taste element of it. Uh, uh, one example would be kind of like li light leaks or or, or uh, uh, you know, these kind of like volumetric lighting, you know, this is, uh, uh, this uh, was incredibly popular for, for, for a while and then, and, and then became, uh, less so. And now maybe it's back. And then, and then, uh, and then from a technology perspective, of course, uh, because, uh, um, uh, we cater to, uh, an industry that also goes through various kind of like technical changes, uh, uh, we've, uh, for, as I mentioned previously, we, we had some products that were really into um, that were focused on delivering uh, uh, stereoscopic uh, workflow solutions, uh, and uh, you know that was uh, that was really big. There was a you know there was a big hype uh, uh, for a couple of years in in, in terms of uh, everyone was getting stereoscopic televisions and and uh, uh, and, and everything and and. and and, and then that didn't uh, didn't quite pan out, right? And so that's uh, those products are you know you know maybe less uh, less important at this time. Maybe uh, you know coming back now with the Vision Pro, you know there's a, a, there's a, a, you know there's a, a new uh, uh, resurgence maybe of uh, of, uh, of of some of those uh, technologies and some of those tools. But yeah, so both taste and kind of like where's the industry going. Um, I, I, there's, there's, there's trends there that, uh, that we follow. Courtney, you have some questions. Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining us, Nicholas. Uh, now I know FX factory is only available on the, on the Mac platform. Mm -hmm. uh, you do support, uh, uh, DaVinci and, um, and the Adobe products, uh, since those do have cross-platform products. Have you ever thought about uh, branching out or do, is it just too daunting to try and support the plethora of hardware combinations that are out there in the uh, Windows and Linux world? Um, I, I mean, I mean, this comes, this question comes up a lot, right? And it's, 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 it's not like we, uh, we don't, uh, we haven't discussed this and we don't think about it uh, at various times. Um, but from from our perspective, uh, our, our focus was always the Mac, uh, and um, uh, we've really uh, never uh, uh, distributed or sold a product for um, for Windows. And um, and in many ways, the technologies that we build. Uh, so there's a kind of like a two part question. It's like I mean, we could theoretically be distribu just distributing other people's products that also work on Windows. Th that wouldn't be technically very difficult, um, but when it comes to uh, our own uh, tools and our own kind of like development platform, that's uh, it, very very heavily based on on what the uh, uh, Macintosh operating system has to offer, and uh, and uh, that's where, uh, from a technical standpoint, our skill has always been been to leverage what the uh, OS Mac OS ha has uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 leveraging that and once you go cross platform you have a completely different kind of like set of uh, um, tools that you need to you, you need to be using in some ways you kind of like have to settle for um, 
you know, some kind of like denominator uh, uh, or I mean, common like user interface. Them. Yeah. 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 And, and so, and so yeah, we've thought about it many times, but, uh, but our, 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 there's no, no immediate plans uh, to do this. Our focus will remain the, remain the Mac. And, and, you know, um, I feel like in, in 2004, when we got started, that was uh, more questionable than it is now. Uh, I, the, the, the Mac is just doing really, really, really well. Uh, at the moment, uh, I, that's the way we feel about it. Uh, it's really like uh, you know, back when we started, it was kind of like uh, you know, people were people were a little worried about us uh, with this decision to focus on the Mac, and and now it doesn't come up that that often, you know. And do you support both the uh, M M one through M three architecture as well as the Intel uh, legacy? Yes, oh. yes, yes, yes. That was a that was a. Um, um, that was a big transition for us. Uh, and that was not uh, that did not come easily. Uh, this uh, this transition, uh, but uh, but yeah, at this point, uh, all the all the products work on uh, work on on all uh, Mac hardware that's uh, that's available. Did most or all of your products that you had existing transition off into being M1 compatible? How how did you see the the transition? How, did I, how do I see it? Well, w were there products that you had in the library that just this really ran well on Intel but didn't make the transition to the M1 oh. series chips? Or did everything seamlessly just manage to no, I mean, double-click it, 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 it was absolutely not seamless, uh, uh, the transition. Um, um, but uh, it was, it was, but in, in, in many ways, because the vast majority of products uh, worked on our work on our architecture, we just had to make sure that our architecture uh, worked well, and then all of the products that that were using it would also work in 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 the on on Apple Silicon. Uh, but it was it was it was uh, it was tough uh, uh, because uh, um, it was tough in in the because the uh, the transition uh, to uh, Apple Silicon brought with it also the uh, transition between. Um, so Final Cut's uh, Final Cut's API went from one version to the next version, and in, in order to use in order to use plugins on the uh, Apple Silicon um, uh, uh, systems, uh, uh, one had to support the newer version of the of, the, of Apple's API, and so and that was just that wasn't an easy uh, that wasn't just like flip the switch and it's going to run, uh, and and it, it wasn't just like the the the. Apple Silicon hardware is, is so incredibly fast uh, uh, and 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 so great that running th things under uh, under emulation uh, was still uh, brought incredible performance. Uh, I, I, um, uh, but um, um, I, I, but we, we we couldn't you you couldn't run uh, the plugins in, in in emulation, so we had to. Uh, 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 switch to a, switch to a completely uh, uh, kind of like new architecture, and 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 that wasn't that wasn't easy. Uh, but uh, but uh, at this point, everything is uh, everything is working working great. I think Alexander had some questions for you. Yeah, the question about specifically audio, uh, and I just noticed uh, w with uh, with respect to film uh, audio restoration, and I noticed you had a movie poster there over your your right shoulder there with Edward Norton. Uh, we see a lot of movies that are being restored now and people are, are looking to the latest cutting edge tools to to fix old audio, movies going back 40, 50, 60, even 70 years now. So are you finding an increased demand for for your type of product for people that, are, that need those kind of tools in the industry? Now, are you getting any good feedback from people that are actually using it? Um, yeah, so I... I uh... In, in terms of like reviving audio for 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 old uh, existing uh, um, movies, it's, it's a good question. I I, uh, I don't actually I don't think I've run into a, a customer a use case where uh, where you know that I know of. Right? Uh, I, I mean, many people 
I mean, I, I like to think we know our customers well, uh, but the reality, of course, is, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we sell a tool and, and with most customers, if the product works well, with most customers, we have no idea what they what they do with it, right? Uh, they, 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 they purchase a, a tool, right? They purchase, uh, you know, a hammer. Uh, and uh, and then they, they they take it home and then they either use it to hang up a painting or to build a house, you know. And, and we don't we don't really we don't really uh, we don't really know. Um, but uh, uh, but when it comes to um, uh, you know the audio tools, I think that this there's there's been a lot of uh, uh, big change. Uh, it used to be very very difficult uh, to. Uh, you know, deal with bad audio, uh, and uh, and thanks to um, thanks to kind of like modern machine learning uh, uh, technology, now it's uh, you know you can you can take some take a pretty bad recording and 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 really uh, you know save it uh, and make it uh, make it sound good, and um, uh, and that's you know we. We sell plugins for this uh, for this purpose, but there's also uh, a lot of built-in functionality now in the various host applications, uh, and, and this uh, and this technology and these uh, these models are, are pervasive. Uh, also in uh, you know in in in, in Zoom now uh, probably uh, this you know this uh, the audio that I'm. Uh, that's being transmitted through this uh, uh, between us is is is, is probably heavily. Uh, you know, cleaned up and, and manipulated so that it sounds uh, that it sounds well. Uh, do you have another question, or let's get into our audience questions, Alexander? All right, our first question here comes from me. How daunting is it to keep up with SDK updates from NLE manufacturers that can cause destabilization if you don't keep up, especially if something is undocumented when it changes? Very good question. I, I um, it, it can be, it can be, uh, it can be very difficult. Uh, I, I mean, it, 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 it really depends. Uh, it depends. Um, but I, but I would say it is a, uh, it is a really uh, big part of what we do in terms of uh, our efforts, our time. Uh, I, I, we, we, we uh, want to always uh, be fully compatible. Uh, with the whatever is the current version of uh, of both the host application and the OS, uh, and because uh, you know both uh, change uh, change quickly and, uh, and 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 both have an effect uh, on, on on the product, and uh, and yeah, every uh, you know every version of uh, of uh, Final Cut uh, of uh, Motion of After Effects of Premiere Pro of every version can potentially break something uh, or, 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 or fix something that was uh, previously broken and we'd, we'd already kind of like had a, implemented a workaround to, uh, that now needs to be removed again because now they fixed something that we had fixed. And they, uh, so there's, 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 it's, 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 it's really like, uh, it, it can be um, uh, a, a, uh, Sometimes uh, months of uh, of uh, of uh, work uh, just to uh, keep things uh, running, so to speak. Uh, and and uh, but that's the that's the uh, you know it's the kind of like the nature of the business, right? Uh, and uh, but it it can be it can be very hard. And I, and I, and and some companies are, are are easier to work with than uh, than others. Some people some companies move very very quickly. Uh, at, at changing things, and other companies, um, you know, maybe move slower uh, at, uh, at at making changes. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it, 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 it's that that is something that kind of like keeps us up at night. You know, if I if I that's the way I'd, I'd say. It. <laughs> Alexander, do you have a follow up to that? Yeah, I think that's that's well said. And obviously, you know, customers. I, I personally haven't used your plugins yet. Uh, but I will say that, you know, a lot of people have, uh, sometimes they have unrealistic, unrealistic expectations, you know, Apple releases a new operating system and they expect plugin manufacturers to be day one up to date. And sometimes it's just not that easy. It's trivial, uh, especially if you're dealing with, with older code that needs to be updated. So my question to you is, um, how public are you with, 
uh, do or do or do you even publicly publish guidelines on like these are the qualified uh, operating systems that we're testing that we you know we expect that you you should stay on these because the, we know these ones are stable and also how do you manage customer expectations when people uh, email you they're upset why haven't you know it's been two three months how come you haven't updated this how come you don't support Sonoma how do you manage that yeah so I I I mean the the way we the way we operate is is we we we're always ready uh for whatever version that's that's at least the the the, the goal and 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 we i think we practically always are ready uh at the time when something um you know when something is uh is released so uh re really what we where we uh where we operate sometimes is kind of um you know how far back do we support uh things because that's that can be very complicated but you can always kind of like install older versions so in that in that case there is kind of like a workaround um i what's made this more challenging is that um at, at this point both kind of like the us and and also uh at least apple's tools kind of like the default is everything auto updates right uh so the default user setup now uh, if Apple flips the switch uh, with the uh, new version of Final Cut or, 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 or Motion, you know, within, I don't know, a day or two or everyone, no, not everyone, but the vast majority of users will have that version. Uh, and um, so, uh, so yeah, so if there's a problem, uh, uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's 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 a huge problem, <laughs> you know, uh, because uh, because it affects everybody. It's it's not like how it used to be, where you know people there would be a new version and people would hold hold back. And like, the vast majority, I mean, there's there's some people who hold back and uh, and are, are very careful with uh, with their updates. But I would say that the vast majority of people just um, just install whatever is the newest stable release. Um, and, uh, and, and 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 lately, we even have uh, you know we have a lot of users that in, install uh, you know the, the the beta versions of uh, of Mac OS uh, uh, that are now publicly um, available, and that is uh, uh, you know that is where we kind of like draw the line. Like uh, we you know when a user expects everything to work in the beta version of the OS, we, we, we usually tell them it's like not fair. <laughs> I, 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 it, it's really, it, it, it's, 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 we, we can't, you know, this is impossible. Uh, uh, we need to, we need to, but in general, the, the, when it comes to customer expectation, uh, it's, it's, it's tough sometimes because if, uh, if, if, a, if something doesn't work, if a plugin doesn't work, uh, it's, it's, uh, the customer doesn't care who's, who's, who's fault the plugin isn't working. But sometimes it's not uh, it's not something we can fix. You know, it, 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 there, there can be situations where the bug is, you know, in the host application or in the in the in the OS. Uh, uh, there, 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 there isn't. You know, and and, and what are we going to do? Like point the finger at, uh, at at somebody else that the customer doesn't care uh, and shouldn't have to care. Uh, uh, and uh, um, but yeah, I, I you know. We, we we do our best to manage manage expectations, but of course, uh, you know, uh, somebody somebody's working on an important project and has a deadline, and then um, and then uh, all of a sudden something doesn't work. Uh, of course, they're very frustrated, uh, and uh, and um, do our, we do our we do our best to um, to, to, to help people. Now, on the other side of that, you get that moment when, you know, I'm doing this project, I don't have a huge budget, I've got a bunch of data that I've got to pop up or something like that, and you just find out, oh, well, the stupid Raisins plug-in that's up on FX Factory does exactly what I want, so you throw $49 at it or something like that, and you've saved 12 hours of madness because you had access to something that pretty much fits exactly what you need. And you didn't have to work a lot to get it done because it was automated by whoever created the plugin that was simple to get and easy to implement. And here it is. And that's what I found over the course of time. When I go looking to solve a problem and your app store comes up, I kind of know, yeah, let me, let me give this a shot and let me take a look. And the vast majority of the time, I'm very satisfied with what comes out the other end, which is 
a lot of extra time for me not having to bespoke every single little circumstance like that. And it was at a price that I could easily just forget about. So everybody's different now. Let's get to the next question. Oh, go ahead. I, I, I want to add, oh, thank you, uh, Bill. This is, this is, this is a, it's a good pitch. I, I, uh, well, that's, I, I, that's been my experience. <laughs> it's a good pitch. I, no, no, thank you. I, I'd like to add that uh, one thing is, is that, you know, all the, all the products uh, um, or the, practically all the products are, have, a, have a trial mode. So the, the, the user can Very just, uh, you, know, if, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a situation, they have a problem or they want something and they want to try something out, they can, they can um, uh, just download the trial and, and the trial is, is um, fully functional uh, and uh, just, it's, it's just watermarked. So they can really, um, you know, the user can really make sure that, that uh, this, this product solves the problem or has the look that they desire uh, uh, for, their, for their product uh, before they, um, before they, you know, uh, pay for it. My biggest problem is that you do that and they go, I love it, but I want to change these 14 things about the thing that you did. And you go, oh, wait a second. Can I get it? Uh, it's a plug in. Maybe I can do that. Maybe I can't. And you have to go digging yeah. down, see whether you can open it in motion. <laughs> it's just so uh, let's go on to the next question. Okay, we got a QR code question from Banks uh, Medor in West Columbia, South Carolina. Wondering if FX Factory will increase its offering of effects and filters for Resolve. Our company has made the move from Premiere. Thank you. Any thoughts, Nick? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I can't be giving any timelines or, 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 or make any promises, but uh, but this is, uh, you know, this has been requested a, a lot. And it's definitely something we're, uh, you know, we're discussing and, uh, and, uh, and looking into. There you go. We've heard that answer before, and I think it's a legit one. Let's go to the next question. Danny Grizzle in Longview, Texas asks, now that Apple has deprecated Quartz Composer, what is the path forward? I remember the day I found that out, and I thought, I, I would imagine that was a big day for you, Nick. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it was... Uh, it was it was uh, you know it was, it was a scary uh, scary moment, but uh, but we've uh, I mean it's still things still run right now I I, I, I you know and um, but um, the the reality is that we've uh, we've invested a, a, a couple of years now into building a um, a new tool uh, that uh, will replace that that layer. Uh, or has replaced that layer uh, that Force Composer uh, used to uh, used to play. So uh, we have a we have a tool called FX4, uh, and that uh, as a development tool uh, that you know uh, maybe uh, looks a little bit in terms of the interface uh, like Force Composer, but is uh, purpose built uh, for uh, for our. Use. Of course, Composer was a much more general uh, development tool, and uh, and now we have a, um, a bespoke replacement, so to, so to speak, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, really designed around uh, the needs of uh, of building plugins, and all of the um, uh, new plugins uh, that are developed uh, using using our using our platform. Uh, already use uh, this uh, this technology and do not use Force Composer anymore. We do still have some products uh, uh, that have uh, that are that rely on uh, Force Composer, but uh, but you know all of all of uh, all of the new ones already are are using FX Core and uh, and the old ones that are still being worked on will will have uh, um, you know the next version be based on FX Core. Uh, also, and so yeah, it's it's, it's sad to see uh, a course composer uh, go, but on the other hand, uh, it, uh, it 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 made the our, our company possible, and it, and it, and it, uh, you know it was an it was an amazing tool. Oliver wanted to get done with this. Oliver, hi Nicholas, uh, good to see you on the show. Um, <laughs> yeah, just a, a quick uh, pitch here for uh, Mimo Composer, which is what we've developed uh, to replace <laughs> Quartz Composer. And uh, 
uh, Nicholas and I had a couple of years ago, we, we discussed uh, various different approaches to this and our approach is to really enable people to uh, uh, load their old quartz compositions and, and use them. And FX Factory went a different route uh, with optimizing their tool for their purposes. So um, there's going to be even more choice for people who were um, uh, fans of Quartz Composer moving forward. And interestingly, the next question comes from? Next question comes from Oliver. What do you think is the coolest product on FX Factory? Uh, I, Ooh, do you have a favorite child from the, <laughs> from the yeah family? i mean I, I don't i don't yeah exactly i don't i don't think i should i, I don't i don't know if i want to answer that they're all they're all beautiful uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and 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 good in, is, some, in some way and the and the coolest category maybe ah the coolest category i um i mean i think that the what's really interesting is uh our, you know, or, or, or maybe some of the, uh, the, the the titling tools. Uh, uh, one product that's uh, that's uh, um, really really impressive uh, that's been released recently is uh, it's the latest version of MoType, which is a, a titling tool uh, from uh, from uh, a company called Yanobox. Oh, yeah. uh, that's a wonderful tool. And then and then of course there's a bunch of. Uh, I, I, Kind of like machine learning AI based uh, tools uh, that um, that, uh, that uh, have been released uh, relatively recently. That are that's a pretty exciting category because obviously there's there's just like a lot of action uh, happening there, and uh, and uh, those are that's a good category for us also. I remember looking at was it Yanabox Mosaic and look at the complexity of that. Is that is that up in FX Factory? That that seemed like it was a huge code base. Yeah, so that's. I mean, that 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 is also. Uh, uh, you know, this is an FX is an FX Factory based product. Uh, uh, but uh, even when you're using Course Composer or FX Score, you can still, uh, you know, extend things with with code, right? Uh, so. So, uh, so yes, Mosaic and Multi, all of the Yandabox products are uh, developed using FX Factory tools, but uh, they, they they usually have some of their own code uh, also uh, running. Yeah, and I Mosaic, the first time I saw that, just being blown away at what was possible in terms of those complex background renders. Yeah, no, it's it's a uh, uh, Yandabox is just really like a, you know an, an artist. I would say. Very much, very much. Let's sneak on to the next question. Roz Humphreys in Comox, British Columbia, Canada asks, I use a number of your plugins, Nick. Thanks. Do you have a preferred venue to showcase your products? A preferred venue? Hmm. Uh, I, I, I'd I say that our most important venue to showcase our product is probably YouTube. Uh, I don't know if that's really the question, that, uh, or, or but uh, I, I'd say that's that's how I would answer that question is YouTube. I think that that's the uh, uh, the place where we uh, where we reach the most uh, I, I, people, and and uh, and also that's where a lot of our customers, uh, you know, present their own uh, their own work, right? Uh, so I, I'd say that's that's the that's the preferred menu. Well, you know, in in researching for this, I decided to hop on the web on my phone and look, and, and so I know that you have an incredible array of products in in your store, so to speak, in in the FX Factory world. I, on my phone, I kept seeing like subsets, and I was going, "How do I get to the full thing? I need to get back to my website." It is is it hard with when you have this many products and this much breadth of possibilities to to show that other than in like the full web browser or something like that or is that just my experience i had it configured wrong somehow? i mean i think i think it's i think it's um i mean uh, i mean first I, first of all i think that the you know uh like really kind of like the 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 uh, you know the experience of uh of uh purchasing plugins and everything is uh, you know those tools are going to be, and you're going to end up using those tools on a on a desktop, right? Uh, so so the so the presentation on the on the phone is really uh, more kind of like informative rather than um, you know 
you know, how, how do you find a solution or how do you how do you browse through the 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 the, the, the breadth of the breadth of the experience? <laughs> we scroll them for hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's so there's a, exactly so there's a lot of there's a lot of product. I I, I think that I think that uh, overall, um, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, you know, the the, the there's there's so many products uh, that uh, you know the the browsing experience is tough. Now, I'd say I'd say I'd say this. Um, if you look at the, uh, uh, you know, the, the iOS app store, the Mac app store, which obviously kind of like, you know, it, you know, orders of magnitude larger in terms of in terms of uh, how many uh, 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 products live there and, and, and are offered there, um, but uh, but it's 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 also a tough browsing experience. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know once you have such a di- diverse kind of like set, then it becomes it becomes difficult. And I think that the from a, from a user perspective, what's more important is uh, the other way around. Not going to the FX Factory website and and being like oh like like what can I find that might be of use here. The the other the other way around, I think, is 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 oh you know I have a I have this problem, let me Google it and and then coming to the to the specific product uh, 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 that way uh, you, you you know like the here's my stated issue and then here's the solution uh, uh, for the uh, for. For, for my for my for my for so my problem. kind of pre-filter your request rather than just I'm going to scroll through until I find what I want. <laughs> There's yeah. just too much there to make that kind of practical. Yeah, but but you know we, we also employ some of the same methods that uh, that other uh, you know app stores would. Right, we have we have staff picks uh, uh, or, or uh, you know uh, things that we we like uh and, and then we have kind of like you know like best sellers kind of like we have a section of kind of going either the new products uh uh that have uh that have uh, just been released you know there's, there's there, you know there there are some categorization there and then of course kind of like you can filter by you know host applications you know which products work for uh um uh, you know final cut or Premiere pro or whatever and then also categorizations of of what type of product is it so you can say uh, you know you can easily say i i want just titling products that work in Premiere Pro or whatever, right? And then, and then there's not going to be that many uh, uh, to uh, to look at in terms of the options. All right, let's go to the next question. Next one's for me. Do you conduct any accessibility tests with your plugins? Um, accessibility tests with the plugins? Um, no. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say no, uh, not that I know of. Uh, what what kind of accessibility uh, tests? Uh, well, tests for for example, like if someone uh, has low vision, if they're using screen readers and they need to, you know they can't see, read the controls, yeah. that kind of stuff. Does and also does the GUI do the GUIs resize? Do they work on larger displays if you if you need to be able to see something? Because um, that's one problem I have with a lot of plugins. Sometimes they can't be resized, and the font it, it can't be adjusted, and you can't really read yeah. it if it's far away. Well, well, when it comes to the, I mean, this is a really interesting question, and, and not a not a topic I know a lot about. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I'm gonna admit that uh, right off the bat. But but in general, the the the, the way the plugins look um, is usually defined by the host application, right? Uh, I, so. Or, or, or at least a big part of it is uh, you can't just do whatever whatever you want, right? Like the the, the uh, usually kind of like there's a, a a set of controls that the uh, host application provides, and then you can you can display that, right? And then you can use whatever that control the value that's the control that you didn't design, uh, uh, but is provided by uh, you know the host application. So uh, you know, there's this is not 100 percent true because obviously you can have kind of like custom control sometimes. You can open your own window uh, at times. You know, there's there, there's uh, you know it, it, it's complex. Um, but the I, I'd say that the vast majority uh, of uh, of the interface uh, is uh, and and the controls is usually provided um, by the host application themselves and 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 uh, not something that uh, uh, we have control over. 
And, and of uh, course, Mac OS itself has accessibility settings sure. where somebody who has visually or auditory impairment or something else might be able to configure their machine to make that easier. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next question. Next question comes from Oliver Breinbach here and on the panel. Do FX factory plugins work with Final Cut on the iPad? No. Uh, they do not. Uh, I, um, um, there's no uh, uh, there's no uh, third-party products uh, for um, Final Cut on the iPad. Do you now, as a developer, do you see any potential in the long range for a little confluence between iOS and Mac OS? It seems like we've had some baby steps in that area uh, without any NDA kind of stuff being involved. Any thought that maybe we'll see a merged OS at some point in the world? Um, I mean, I think that that's. I, I mean, this is kind of like a larger, a larger discussion. I don't even know where to begin <laughs> with this question, but I, I, uh, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I bet you do. I have a lot of, a lot of thoughts. Uh, but I, but be I think, NAB, we'll have a cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, I think that I, 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 I think, and I hope uh, I, that um, the, 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 that uh, you know on both platforms will uh, will live on and because they both have uh, strengths and weaknesses uh, and and I think that uh, you know if you want to uh, prime everything together then uh, uh, that's uh, you're gonna you're gonna lose out on something mm, uh, okay. um, but uh, but uh, uh, you know uh, but certainty uh, there's uh, there's uh, there's a lot of elements uh, where uh, it does make sense uh, for things to uh, work really well uh, together. You know. Let's go to the next question. Next one's from Courtney Gooden from Hollywood, California. Do the recent lawsuits from the EU and US over Apple and the software store affect the plugins available for sale in the Apple Store, and how are trial versions handled? So we do not use the uh, uh, Mac OS App Store at all. We're kind of like our own App Store, and uh, and um, we couldn't operate in the way we operate uh, uh, on the Mac on, on iOS, right? Like this is a uh, um, and now this is what's what's changing in Europe now. Um, I mean, I'm no I'm no expert on the on this on this topic on on what what's happening in Europe with the uh, iOS App Stores, um, but. Um, I, I I I don't think that it uh, has any direct uh, you know uh, effect on on us um, uh, as of uh, as of now. I mean, who knows what the future will bring? I mean, this is definitely kind of like an interesting topic. Um, uh, right now, we still we can we we can we have the capability of uh, of running this uh, this uh, this this. This app store or this uh, you know distribution uh, uh, system uh, on the on the Mac, and uh, um, and uh, and I'm and I'm assuming uh, uh, you know the, the way what I read about how it works in Europe now then you know uh, technically this would be possible on iOS now in Europe also but not in the states. Uh, I I don't, I don't know how that's going to play out. And, and when it and the second part of the question the um, the trials. Uh, yeah, we, we, the way our trials work is that the products are just fully functional, and then they um, they they render a watermark. Um, but other than that, you can really like try everything out, and then once you purchase, the watermark is removed. Plenty of time to kick the tires for the full functionality. We've got a couple more questions. We'll see if we can get to them before we finish up in time. Uh, Courtney, you had a thought on that one. No, I think he answered it pretty, pretty completely. Uh, I just thought in the Apple Store they had regular, uh, besides uh, iOS, they had regular uh, Mac uh, OS X apps available. But you sell directly from your website, uh, and all the are all the plugins available from your website carried through your website or from the individual uh, vendors of the of the plugins. So, so, so the way uh, uh, our ecosystem works is that there's an FX Factory app that you install on your Mac. And then that app uh, is um, 
manages all of the uh, uh it handles the all the commerce and purchasing of plugins then. Yeah, yeah yeah and also but also installations updates uh, uh you know it, it, everything that needs to be everything that needs to be done is is, is run in this app. just like the you know uh, on on your mac the, the mac app store is also an app right that you uh, mm -hmm. that you launch uh right. where you then see the see the various products so that's that's how it works I got to I got to tell the story. The one thing that annoyed me about you originally, your products was uh, you get the kind of host app and all of a sudden you see this was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. You look and you go, look at all these plugins, look at all these things I can do because they all showed up early. And then you go, oh, if I want to do that, I have to get the big package. I, I don't think it works like that anymore. But it was always, oh, that'd be useful. Oh, gosh, I could use that. Oh, for this project, I need that. And I double click on it and go, well, I wasn't quite installed on the whole thing i never bought the full package back in those yeah. early days because i was starving <laughs> anyway uh next question next one comes from douglas carmichael could you ever see the platform vendors blackmagic design at all integrating an fx factory store into their apps yeah i can i mean i i uh, i'd say that um Adobe has uh, um, has had a, a marketplace, right? Uh, uh, already, um, but um, I, I can't tell you uh, how how successful it is. But I but I think that the um, the vast majority of uh, of plugin products for that for that uh, for the Adobe apps is still sold outside of uh, their their. Um, their internal marketplace, but I, 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 I don't know. But I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not far fetched uh, uh, of an idea, of an idea um, uh, for for a, a host application when vendor to uh, to take that approach. Now I ask question. Last question comes from Roz Humphreys in Comox, and, and she has a follow-up follow there. Uh, just a follow-up, is there any particular YouTube channel that captures the latest plugins effectively? Um, I mean, I'm going to say, I mean, our own. <laughs> our own YouTube and, channel. And if you right? do a search on FX Factory on YouTube or something like that, you will, you will, if you get to the website, there is kind of recent releases, the most current stuff. And you can click on those and look at them, see what they do, kind of get that free trial going if you want to. So in that respect, they're all pretty accessible, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, if you if you go to if you go to our YouTube channel, the FX Factor YouTube YouTube channel, it will show, um, you know, if you sort by date, then you know you'll you'll see whatever the the latest uh, release is, both tutorials and kind of like promotion videos for uh, for for all the products. We're at the top of the hour, Nick. Thank you so much for coming in and explaining this world to us. I, I would assume that most of us who've been around the Macs and, and PCs probably for a long time have been aware of you because you've been doing it for such a long time. Uh, I have benefited tremendously over the course of my practice and career with innumerable products uh, from FX Factory. And so thank you for all of those. Uh, Tomorrow, we're going to be breaking down our Reach and Eclipse live coverage, talking about what worked, what didn't, how we connect, connected to things or didn't uh, for our multiple field teams across the U.S. live during that one-time event. Uh, thanks, as always, to the producers, those of you who ask questions and who come here every day and keep this conversation going. We really appreciate what you do for us. Without your questions, this show doesn't really exist. So, uh we our appreciation every day. To the panelists who show up every day to add their expertise and answer everybody's questions, thank you very much. Our amazing back-end crew, this crew that assembles all across the globe uh, and just does an amazing job of appearing every morning and running everything. You know, the audio is coming out of one part of the world. The video uh, person who's switching the show could be somewhere entirely different. This distributed production is an amazing thing to witness every day as we launch it and go on. And it gives us the ability to bring people like Nick to you and let you see it no matter where you are. So far flung is our group and our listeners and viewers that if you were to have to go to everybody's place to get the answers to hear from people today, it would have been 170, or excuse me, 70,000 miles or 113,000 kilometers you would have had to make in the Tlaloc Traversal. That is six or 554 million. 
Bananas for Scale. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Nick, thank you so much for Thanks, being Nick. here. Awesome. Awesome. You can have Kev a plug-in that calculates those bananas for scale in there. Yeah. Automatic. Yeah, I go to see. the after hours with Mimo Live and we can show you how to do that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what is it? One hour or two hours from now? Is it 11 a.m. Pacific or 10 a.m. Pacific? 11 a.m. Pacific. Yeah. 11 a.m. Pacific for... Yeah, two, uh, two hours from now. Yeah. Two hours. Great. Show up, learn something about Mimo Live. You'll enjoy it.